am Lucas Fitzgerald, the principal of Pacific Lutheran Junior Senior High School. The great news is my time has been extended to 41 minutes of introduction. <laughs> Pastor Gibson is uh, going down to 47 seconds, and Dr. Espinoza will talk now. So I was told I have about 13 minutes, but we'll see uh, how it goes. First, I want to represent uh, our school and welcome you to our campus. It is a gift uh, to have you here. Uh, we have 51 junior high school students. That would be grades 6, 7, and 8. And we have, I think it's 73 high school students. And my math would be 124 students in grades 6 through 12. The reason we have this conference here is I've wanted as a leader of the school to take a stand for life. I have a pastor friend named Pastor Marin. Uh, he can't make it today due to uh, some things going on in his life, so we'll keep him in prayer. Uh, but he came to me one day and said, can we use Pacific Lutheran for a pro-life conference? My response, less than sanctified, was how much do I get? <laughs> he said, nothing. I go, I'll take it. So we decided with that uh, duality to turn into a triumvirate, and we got uh, Dr. Espinoza involved, who has a big impact nationally on life. And so the three-headed, I guess, monster, if you would, said, we want to do a pro-life conference at Pacific Lutheran. So we're honored to have you here. This is a gift. We have, I think, as of yesterday, 73 different Christian churches represented. I think we have, okay. Uh, we have uh, 13 denominations and then various spectrums of non-denomination, which is a denomination, which gets very confusing quick, but let's just go 14 different denominations. Very good. So we have a really wide group. Uh, the, I was going to do stats. The biggest church had, you know, 21 people, and it was this person. You get a Chick-fil-A. I said, I got too busy. I couldn't do that. I was setting up tables. Uh, but we do have, uh, let's uh, do a few churches. St. Paul's, Irvine. I want you to clap if you're from there. <laughs> Pastor's clapping loud to make it sound louder. Okay. <laughs> How about Emmanuel Orange? Okay. How about Emmanuel Redondo Beach? <laughs> we, we love you. A little baby doesn't count. Not count, not clapping as loud. All right, how about uh, First Lutheran Manhattan Beach? How about St. James Catholic Church? How about Nova Church? I hear you, Nova. I hear you, Nova. So, and I uh, can't think of the other 71 off the top of my head, hence my relatively low SAT score. But if you came from a church, yes, yes. If you did not know this was a life conference, this would be awkward. Is anybody unaware of this at this point? All right. Uh, Pacific Lutheran High School is 23 years old, so I guess we can drink in most states. Uh, we are the most ethnically diverse LCMS junior senior high school in the United States. Let's hear it for that. I mean, at the end of the day, that just means we're different colors and different nationalities, but it's kind of cool, right? That's something to put on a bumper sticker. Uh, our school is very proud to be Lutheran Christian, and all that means. And I also tend to say, and we're not jerks about it. So we do believe that the LCMS church has just about the best way of articulating God's truths as are found in Holy Scripture. So we really are proud of that history. But we're also aware that we have to share this message with many, many people that aren't Lutherans, and we're not going to do it in a way that makes people think that only LCMS Lutherans are the ones that are in heaven. So this is the balance that we try to do, is be faithful to our tradition and yet accessible and open to probably our 85% of our student body that's not Lutheran. And the 40% of the people here say hopefully you're feeling welcomed and loved, uh, even though you may not be Lutheran. So we want to get kids ready for college. We want to preach Christ crucified, and we want to remain faithful to Lutheran confessions. That is Pacific Lutheran Junior Senior High School. Uh, we are proud to have the lowest price tuition of any school around. For junior high school, it's $5,000 for an entire year. For high school, it is $7,000 for an entire year. 
Most Christian high schools are 15, 17, 19, 21 thousand dollars, and we here are trying to keep costs as low as possible, so as many of these kids over here and upstairs can hear about Christ crucified and get a great education. So as long as I'm associated with the school, we're going to have as many people that either look like me or don't look like me. It's going to be a faithful Lutheran school, and we are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God for the salvation for everybody who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. So thanks be to God for that. There's my little tiny sermon, even though I'm not a pastor. I'm a principal, and I'm t- All right. Well, don't know. Nobody wants to clap for principals. I'm, am I dredging back uh, bad memories from anybody? Students, keep your hands down. Am I dredging back any bad memories, principal? You know, dean's list, pastor, hilarious. Very funny. Okay. All right. So the rationale for this conference is to bring people from a a varied background to get a chance to hear some of the best and brightest minds uh, on uh, gene editing, on people that have gone through abortions, on people that want to have loving responses and want to say something, don't know how to say it, and just to get equipped. So this campus is yours to uh, enjoy for the next uh, two days, today and tomorrow. All of the sessions are going to be downstairs, so rooms uh, 104 through 108. Those will start, I believe, at 345. There's one at 345 to 445. And then there's the second session for today from 4, uh, I think it's 5 to 6, if I have that right. But check the uh, programs. On page 2 is an outline for the entire day. We'll do our best to do everything decently in good order and stick to that uh, schedule as you see it. Uh, We have to guess of which speakers we think will be, you know, the ones that really can fill up a room. So it'll be really awkward if there's four people in here, which will be one of the venues. So if you wander in here for the AC, you're going to get like a bonus 30% today. So who's in here first session? Who's my... uh, Okay, all right, Dr. Salmi. So 30% uh, improvement with the air conditioning. Then we have the big chapel, uh, Air Force Two. That will be for what we guess to be the second most popular thing. But please don't be offended if you're in room 107 and, you know, the projector mostly works. Find me, we'll fix it. We just don't know. We're doing a a big uh, guess on what we think is going to happen today. So I think there's six choices uh, starting at 345. Abby Johnson's going to be here. Uh, pretty soon, uh, and she's going to be talking about her story and doing a Q&A uh, right after that. Uh, so Pastor Marilyn, I mentioned, couldn't be here. Pastor Espinosa did all of the planning for worship. He's put in probably dozens of hours on this conference. Could we thank him for all of his time? Uh, we got a grant from the Lutheran Church National Mission Office, I believe, of $4,000 to pay for this conference, if we could thank them for that. Uh, we have had sponsors for any speaker fees, any travel accommodations that need to be done. We've had thousands of dollars donated. Uh, the school also donated. So we have a lot of people that are making this conference work, and it's a free conference. Maybe it's the first of many. Maybe you'll be at the 13th annual Defending Life Conference. Hopefully not the high school students. It means you did bad in English, too. Uh, but this is hopefully the first of many, and we have over 300 people. So a lot of people involved, Pastor Espinoza being a chief among them, Pastor Marin being one, and my uh, contribution. So welcome, welcome, welcome. I've been getting questions, so let's do a little bit of logistics, and I'll hand it off. Uh, we have bathrooms in this room either side. Uh, we have restrooms at the end of each of the buildings. So it's a two-story building. There's girls' and boys' restroom or men and women's restrooms on each side on each end. There's free water and free snacks that's in front of Christ Chapel. Uh, If you're not going to a session, any open room, hang out, um, enjoy our school, enjoy uh, our site. We have about 50 leftover Chick-fil-A sandwiches, so if you want to head down to the cafeteria, uh, we will get you uh, round number four or five or two or whatever it may be. Uh, We have sufficient carbs with the chips, and uh, let me know or any of our staff members know if you need any help. We're here to serve you as uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm about four minutes early, but that's okay. I don't think I, did I miss anything, Dr. Espinoza? Uh, just point out page nine is the, probably the most important page for the breakaway. Okay. Is that your bio? <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's not his bio. Okay. If you want to turn to uh, page nine, let's do that together. So next to uh, each breakaway session will be the time, will be the classroom. Uh, will be the topic. So you have some choices uh, to make. My treasurers, James in here, James Fearn. Yeah, James said, there's so many good ones, I don't know what to pick. Well, you need to pick. 
If you're going to walk out halfway through, it's kind of a walk of shame to some degree. So just start sneezing or something repeatedly, and you can uh, chalk it up to hay fever, and they won't know it was due to a less than stellar presentation. But everybody who's presenting is giving up their time and talents, and we appreciate uh, that today. Uh, so schedule's on 9. Uh, we will have evening worship led by uh, Pastor Berkey today, so we're looking forward to that. And any questions that wouldn't be awkward public questions at this point? All right. So it's my pleasure to introduce one of our uh, important dignitaries here. We have uh, Dr. Reverend District President of the uh, Pacific Southwest District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Uh, Pastor Mike Gibson is here to welcome everybody and talk a little bit about the conference. So Dr. Gibson. Yep. Good afternoon. It's good to be here and a blessing to be invited to be uh, participate in this. When uh, Dr. Espinosa contacted my office and said, hey, we're going to do this thing. Do you want in? And absolutely. This is a topic and an issue on my heart that all of us have, I, in this room at least, and a chance for us to do this together to focus on some things that are critical for the church in our world today. Um, one of the things I've done for the last 13 months now is I've traveled all over our district. And our district is Santa Barbara on the coast all the way to the Mexico border, the Las Vegas area of Nevada, and all of Arizona. There's 300 congregations, 150 schools, this one being one of the crowning schools in our district. And I have learned so much from listening to people. But one of the things I've heard from people that, that concerns me is a belief that many in the church have today that the church is being pushed and has been pushed out to the margins where it's no longer in a place of significant influence. And that's not true. This next week we're going to celebrate and remember uh, as a nation the 9-11 event. And there's an image from that that has stuck with me that is really going to be one of my primary things I'm going to talk about during my second year in, in, as president of the district. And so pastors that are here is going to be a pastor's conference. You get a little taste right now for just a moment. And it goes this way. On 9-11, we're told that when everyone else ran out of the building, what did the first responders do? They ran in. My friends, that's what the church needs to be today. We can stand out on the edges and we can bemoan and we can whine and we can complain that nobody wants to listen to us anymore and we can have our pity party or we can be the people who are bold enough, strong enough, firm enough, convinced enough by the word of God that God has put his spirit inside of us to be people who can be influenced to be an influence for our world, that they might know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And from that seem their lives changed, and because of that, our world begins to shift and change because of the influence of believers. But if we stand on the edges and go, oh, how horrible, it's never going to happen. The purpose of the Pacific Southwest District is to resource congregations and schools in discipling, and to make the Great Commission real. What this conference does is to disciple in a critical subject matter that allows us without hesitation by the time you're done tomorrow, that's my prayer, to engage from the fringes back into the middle, running with confidence and certainty in the name and the hope of Jesus Christ to see a world that needs to hear the things that you're going to have to say because of what's going to happen in this next day and a half. So I am grateful for those who've put this together. I'm grateful for all of you that have come, and I'm thrilled with the diversity that we have from all the different churches and such that are part of this, because God's called all of us to be in this together. So thank you for uh, inviting me, and I'll look forward to seeing some of you in an unconditioned chapel in a few hours, okay? And uh, we'll get a chance to connect. Lucas, God bless you, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'd like to bring up uh, Dr. Uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, Al Espinoza as one of our co-leaders of the conference to talk to you for a little bit.
like to get properly warmed up because we want the Lord to uh, speak through his people as he promises to do uh, through his word as we proclaim it. And a good way for me to warm up is to sing if you'd help me out. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus, who is the light of the world and who has called us to be your little lights. <clears throat> to shine in the darkness and to proclaim Jesus a light who is a life and to know Christ our light is to know life and to be your people who proclaim it and witness to it and defend it to those we are called to love recognizing your gift of life has been given to all and that Christ came to shed his blood for all to conquer death for all we pray that your word would permeate and be spread so that your Holy Spirit would create saving faith, that we would cling to Jesus, that we would live for you, that we would celebrate the gift of life in the little ones and hold them close. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to gather as a people of God to be further equipped that we may be your true disciples who defend life and who speak up for the unborn. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I want to compliment what uh, Lucas said about the, the beginnings of this. And, uh, of course, all glory goes to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. However, he does work through instruments. And uh, a key instrument was Reverend Blaise Marin, who cannot be here today. And uh, this is all uh, Blaise's fault. Um, I was talking to him about what we do uh, every other year in Washington, D.C., in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. We have a conference, a life conference, where we take part in the National March for Life. And uh, a year ago, Blaze started to drill into my ears, we should do a conference here. And he wouldn't let it go. Dude, really busy, man. And he just wouldn't stop. And so, uh, to make his case all the more compelling, he made the preparations. He talked to Lucas Fitzgerald. He started to fill in the blanks. He said, we can do this. And so, I had to get on board. I had no choice. Thanks be to God. And so, uh, thanks to Blaze, who can't be here, but I hope he's watching right now. We have this live streaming. And uh, thank you to Lucas Fitzgerald. Um, and he has his way, you know, you've, you've heard his... Um, his, you, know, you see his personality, and you, you can't help but love the man. Um, and he is a tireless worker for the kingdom of God. Um, I'm crazy about this man, and I want to keep working with him, if the Lord permits, for a long, long time. And so we're already talking about doing this again in a couple years. And uh, in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, we have just passed a national synodical resolution, 1-06, looking at the big picture. If you're going to defend life, you're going to celebrate life and rejoice in the Lord always, you're going to be talking about marriage, life, and family. So in the years to come, we pray to be focusing on these other crucial areas as we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we started the planning. And in the process and getting excited about what was to come, my dear wife, Tracy, who is the awesome mother of our eight children and the grandmother of our, we're going to have five coming up here in October, thanks be to God, she and I went to see the movie Unplanned. Now, it caught my eye because I, I, I read a, a report that the movie was doing well in the box office, and I was, I was genuinely impressed. 
Because obviously a, me a message uh, that, that is a Christian message, doing well in the box office? Wow, got to see this. I walked out of that movie, of course, tears streaming down my face, but inspired in incredible ways. And uh, my wife and I were talking about it, celebrating the movie. And I said, we have got to find a way to get Abby Johnson to come here. And so I got in the cab of my car, and before we took off driving, I was already on the phone. I was sending out emails. I was praying so that Abby would come. And she came. My uh, responsibility is gospel contextualization. And um, by the way, besides thanking uh, Lucas and, and Blaze, I uh, want to thank all of the keynote presenters. Besides Abby, we also have Michael Solomink, who is the director of Lutherans for Life here. And yeah, I am not kidding you. After I saw his last presentation in Washington, D.C., I was blown away. He was speaking to a wide range of folks, including high schoolers and college age folks, and they, he, he had them captivated, and he equips in a way that is just phenomenal. We also have a keynote speaker in Kathleen Eaton Bravo, who has done some amazing work with Obria Medical Clinics. Yeah. And um, we also have, we have some great breakaway presenters. And we're really trying to cover the gamut and looking at the big picture. So we're doing everything from fatherhood to a new, fresh approach to the book of Genesis and God's providential leading of life and our call to protect it. We have the full personhood of the baby in the womb in both the Old Testament and New Testament. We have some fantastic things going on. We, we hope you'll enjoy those breakaways. We want, to, we want to thank all 18 breakaway presenters for what they're doing for us in the next two days. And I want, to thank my, I want to thank my family, my dear wife, Tracy, who's been my constant support, my most important partner in life, um, who's shown me the beauty of life, and my eight children. Um, my eldest is here. He is teaching one of the breakaways, Reverend A.J. Espinoza. Um, my other children, my daughter, Elizabeth, number two, who is almost 35 weeks pregnant. Where are you, Elizabeth? There's my next grandbaby sitting over there with mom. <laughs> And uh, the other kids, including, um, including my, my five children that the Lord permitted us to adopt, who taught us more about the rest of the story. You defend life, and then you get to serve, and you see how they strengthen you, and they show you the face of God. And I was going to say even through trial, but I'll say especially through trial. Because they teach us to humble ourselves before the Lord and call on his name and they teach us to be better parents. And I have been blown away to, be, to have that privilege to be a foster dad and then an adoptive dad. And they're my children. Love them just like the other ones. So we are participating uh, with 40 Days for Life when I was a pastor in the Woodlands, Texas, outside of Houston, Texas. We had a family uh, ministry, a life ministry, and so we teamed with 40 Days for Life and we were downtown Houston, and uh, we were doing our thing. Uh, we were praying. We were reading the Psalms. We were singing hymns. We were trying to give other literature and resources to the people thinking about coming into Planned Parenthood. And as we were praying and, and doing our thing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, a woman from the neighborhood approached us, walked up to me, I was wearing my clerical collar, and said, um, Pastor, may, may I join you? I said, may, may you join us? Absolutely. Welcome. So she came in alongside of us, was praying in the name of the Lord, was reciting the Psalms with us, and uh, in between started to share about her life with me. And this beautiful woman said, I'm here to defend life. I have a son. And I don't know what I'd do without my son. And she started to tell me about her son. Their son went to a top-notch university, came back to the Houston area, became an attorney. 
She's so proud of what God had done in the life of her son. And I was overjoyed to hear this testimony of a woman of God who loves raising her children. And then she got to the next part. She said, Pastor, I also had a daughter. And she started to confess to me about a decision she had made. And she said, I often thought of what she would be like. Needless to say, I saw the Lord open a broad door. And as she was confessing and sharing her burden, it was finally coming out, all the stuff that she had been carrying. She got on her knees because she couldn't stand. And so I knelt down with her, and I shared with her the beautiful gift of holy absolution. And I asked her permission to share that gift with her. And she said, yes. I put my hand on her and I proclaimed her forgiveness through the blood of the lamb in the name of the father and of the son and of the Holy Spirit. And that day I met a Christian sister who made me a better pastor and a better husband and a better father. And I saw God working good even through the hard stuff. In 2014, the movie was released called The Son of God. And they depicted a scene from Matthew's gospel, which made an incredible impression on me. I love Matthew's gospel. I've read this section many, many times. But I think they nailed it in terms of showing what was going on when our Lord Jesus Christ met Matthew. Matthew the tax collector. And as you well know, at that time in the culture and the world, the two greatest sinners in society and culture were prostitutes and tax collectors, scum of the earth. But Jesus had already made it clear that he came for sinners through sinners. We read about that in Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy of Jesus. And have you noticed how certain women are highlighted in that genealogy? Jesus wanted the world to know that his great-great-grandmothers were specifically who? Tamar. Rahab. Ruth. Uriah's wife. Who was that? Bathsheba. Jesus wanted to know that he came to show he came to associate with sinners to save sinners. So Tamar had presented herself as a prostitute. Rahab was a prostitute. Ruth was a Moabitess, considered an outsider. And Bathsheba, known for David's adultery. And he wanted the world to know, I have come for such as these. And Matthew is celebrating that in his own account, that he came for such as these. Because in Matthew chapter 9, this is what we have in the word of God. Matthew 9, verse 9 is the calling of Matthew. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. 
And when we get that, by God's grace, through faith in Christ, that's worked by the power of the word and the holy sacraments, this is the work of God. When we get that, then we can really appreciate one of the things depicted in the movie, Unplanned. One of my favorite comparisons and contrasts in the movie. At one point, what is depicted in representing the story that we're going to hear more of from Abby Johnson is evidently, evidently, that as she was going into Planned Parenthood, she encountered certain Christians who did not show compassion, who didn't behave as though they knew they too were sinners. And later, evidently, if this is true to life, I guess we're going to find out. She met others who were true to the faith, who were compassionate, who didn't act like they were in a different boat or a different level. And they spoke to her with respect and with kindness, with gentleness. And this is our call. And our world is starving for compassionate Christians who do not live in fear and therefore put themselves on the sidelines, like President Gibson said. But Christians who are full of the Spirit, who delve in and say, it's okay. Because no matter who I identify out there as a great sinner, I am just as they are. And because Christ came for me, he came for them. And I can speak to them as a fellow sinner who has found the grace of God in Christ Jesus. And if that doesn't want to make you share the gospel and to speak up for those who cannot speak themselves, then nothing will. So yes, we are here to defend life, the unborn. Open your mouth. Judge righteously. Defend the right of the poor and the needy. But remember, as we speak for the unborn, the poor and the needy are not only the unborn. The poor and the needy include those who are filled with shame and guilt and fear, who need Christians to be a light and to show them the compassion and love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we're here. Our view in the Lutheran Church of Missouri, and it's not my goal to talk about Lutheranism all day. I think it speaks for itself as we proclaim the word of God. But we are not here to demonize anybody. We are not here to make walls and divide and get militaristic and get on our high horse like that tax collector in Luke chapter 18. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. No. But instead, to witness, to rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say it again, rejoice. To be people of 1 Peter 3.15 who understand our call to set apart Christ as Lord in our hearts, and to always be prepared to give an answer to anyone that asks for the hope that is within us. And to do it with what? Gentleness and respect. Do it with gentleness. Love. Let people see that you care. And do it with respect, knowing the Lord of life is there with you. <laughs> And he calls us to reflect his son, Jesus Christ. I know it's a little warm. But uh, I think in a minute you're going to feel a lot cooler because I now have the wonderful honor of introducing our special speaker today. This is on my smartphone. Problem is, I'm not very smart. Aha. Uh -huh. You've already heard my testimony of my impression of the movie and how that inspired me, but I want to share this with you. All Abby Johnson ever wanted to do was help women. Her passion surrounding a woman's right to choose even led her to become a spokesperson for Planned Parenthood fighting to enact legislation for the cause she so deeply believed in. 
However, she experienced a change of heart while participating in an ultrasound guided abortion procedure. Today, Abby travels across the globe sharing her story, educating the public on pro-life issues, advocating for the unborn, and reaching out to abortion clinic staff who will work in the industry. Her story has been featured on Fox News, The Mike Huckabee Show, The O'Reilly Factor, Focus on the Family, and numerous other print and media programs. She also, she also is the author of the nationally best-selling book, Unplanned, which chronicles both her experiences within Planned Parenthood and her dramatic exit. The movie adaption, Unplanned, the movie, was released in the spring of 2019. And it is my great honor and privilege to welcome and to introduce to you Abby Johnson. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you guys. It's so good to be here with you today. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. All right. It's so good to be here with you today. Um, I'm like fanning myself. I'm like, I'm from Texas. You think like we wouldn't be hot. Like you think that this would be like cool weather for us. It's only, you know, 110 degrees there. So um, anyway, it's, it's always great to be in California speaking about life. Um, you know, people would have you believe that there are no pro-lifers in the state of California. And you are here to say, we are here and we are speaking out. So that's really exciting. I, I mean, I think, did, were most of you here to watch my film this morning? Yeah, so, you know, I'm not going to give like my long talk that I usually give because, you know, you've seen my story. So, um, but I will talk to you a little bit just um, about the film and how it happened and sort of what has taken place um, since all this. Actually, two days ago, I was looking on my Time Hop app and uh, five, it was like five years ago, two days ago that uh, I had posted on my Facebook page, on my private page, which is family and friends, I had said, please pray the directors of God's Not Dead want to have a phone call with me about turning my book into a film. And little did I know five years ago that that would actually happen and um, that, you know, my, my film would be on the big screen. And, um, but I remember getting the email I got this very nonchalant, uh, casual email from these two guys. I did not know their names. Um, and they said, you know, hi, our names are Chuck and Carrie. We are filmmakers. Um, and we are wondering if you would ever be interested in turning your book, Unplanned, into a major motion picture. And I thought, okay, sure, you're filmmakers right like I thought okay it's like two guys in their office home office like on their Mac right like using video editor or something and I was like yeah sure and um and honestly at the time I just it was never something that I had considered and uh so I told my husband about it and I said you know I just I don't really know, you know, what to say. I mean, I'd gotten emails like that before, and it just wasn't something I was ever really into. And um, and honestly, I felt like I had been vulnerable enough. I thought I I've shared enough. I've I've written books. I've spoken all over the place. People don't need to see my life on a screen. That's another that's another step right? A vulnerability. And I thought, I don't, I don't want to go there. And so, um, my husband said, well, maybe you should, you know, maybe you should just talk to them and see what they have to say. And I said, well, all right, I'll talk to them. So we, we got on the phone and, uh, had a great conversation, but at the end I just thought, 
No, I just, I don't want to set myself up like that. I just don't want people to see the worst part of who I was across the country. I, I don't want people to see it. And my husband said, well, have you prayed about it? And I was like, ugh. <laughs> I was like, no. And he was like, well, maybe you should pray about it. And so after I did, um, I thought, well, maybe I should have some more conversations with them. So I did. And um, we, they ended up flying to Austin where I live. And we had more conversations and they talked to my parents and they talked to Doug and they met all of my kids and we had this great time. And I thought, okay, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe this is something we're supposed to do. And I felt really at peace about it. And so I said, well, let's continue the conversation. And so we did. And after some deliberation and, and lots of prayer, we decided this was something that we wanted to move forward on. And so, um, we were, uh, we, you know, once the contract was signed, you know, they were ready to hit the ground running, writing the screenplay, getting everything together. And, uh, they called me one day and they said, Abby, we're, we were about to start writing the screenplay and the Lord told us, to wait. And I was like, well, okay. Now these guys are truly two of the most prayerful men I've ever met. So I, I trust their discernment, right? So I said, okay, well, if the Lord has told you to wait, then let's wait. When I found out who Chuck and Carrie were, when I found out who Chuck Hansman and Carrie Solomon were, and I found out that they had done God's Not Dead, I was sort of like, meh. I don't know that I want my story to be a cheesy Christian film, right? I mean, honestly, I thought God's Not Dead was fine, but it's not really, that's not me, right? I'm, I'm grittier. I have a more difficult story. I want it to be authentic. I want it to be honest. And one of the reasons that I decided to go ahead and go with them was because they looked right at me when I told them that, and they said, it's time to take the training wheels off of Christian film. It's time to show Christians the truth. And I said, okay. So uh, during that time of waiting, they ended up going on and doing God's Not Dead too. And great. So, you know, we all thought, okay, good. That was, you know, that's why they were waiting. So they get the film done and they get right back to it and they, they are about to start writing. And they call me one day and they said, Abby, the Lord has told us to wait. And I was like, stop listening to the Lord. <laughs> I was antsy, right? I wanted to get this out. This had been going on for years, you know? And, um, but, you know, they didn't listen to me. They listened to God. So, uh, so they waited. And in the fall of 2016 the presidential election was taking place. And abortion was everywhere. Talk of abortion was everywhere. It came up in every presidential debate. Donald Trump was speaking pretty boldly for a presidential candidate about the topic of abortion. And look, you know, I, don't, I know people have their opinions about Donald Trump, but in the end, we have never had a president that is standing up for against abortion more than Donald Trump has. So I mean, we all have issues, we all have our faults, but he has promised us that he would stand up for the unborn and he has come through on those promises. So um, he was really making a lot of promises though about abortion, everything, and everybody was talking about abortion. And in, time, in a time of prayer, Chuck and Carrie looked up at the same time, looked at each other, and said, 
God just told me now. They both felt it at the same exact time. They said, God just told me now. And Chuck said, me too. God just told me now. Two weeks later, after God had told them, go ahead and start moving, they started writing. Two weeks later, Donald Trump was elected as our president. We could not have planned the release of this film on our own accord. This was planned at just the right moment. And I know that because the country was ready for a film like Unplanned when it came out. We had just seen in January and February of that year Governor Northam from the state of Virginia coming out and saying, if a baby's born alive, it's fine. You just let it die. We had New York passing late-term abortion bills, lighting up the One World Center for abortion in honor of abortion. We had states passing bills that were going to essentially legalize infanticide. And right on the heels of that came the release of Unplanned. We had no idea when we set the release date that those things would be happening in our country at that time. I mean, God was truly, his hand was all through this project from day one. So... You know, it was, uh, it was an exciting time. It was released March uh, 29th, and uh, the critics thought we would make about 40 bucks. <laughs> and uh, we ended up making right at $20 million in, in U.S. theaters. Uh, it, it had the number one per screen average, so uh, even over Captain Marvel. So eat that, Marvel. We're... Uh, so that means that for every theater that had a showing of Unplanned, it was packed. Uh, theaters were selling out. It ended up running in the United States in theaters for 14 weeks. We thought if we get it in the theater four weeks, it would be a miracle. It ran for 14 weeks in many, in many theaters across the country. And then we had this uprising from Canada. And pro-life Canadians said, we want unplanned. And their prime minister said, no. <laughs> unplanned will not be allowed to be played here in Canada. And the Canadian people said, that is not what a democracy looks like, and we're doing it anyway. So... Petitions went around, both of the, we could not find a distributor, a Canadian distributor for the film. We didn't know if it was going to happen. We didn't know if we were going to have to privately license Unplanned to play in churches across Canada. We didn't think it would get into a theater, but we continued to pray. And one day, Chuck and Carrie got a call from a guy that ran an independent film distribution company, and he said, I'm willing to take on Unplanned. We went to the two largest theater chains in Canada, and they both said, heck no, we don't want anything to do with this. Our prime minister doesn't want it. We don't want it. Our media team alerted the public, this is what's happening, and people with those movie chains who were pro-life and were investors in those movie chains rose up and said, if you don't play this film, we are pulling our money. Guess what? <laughs> Unplanned played in theaters in Canada, much to the chagrin of the prime minister and the majority of the members of parliament. Uh, we started getting calls 
from other places, countries saying we want unplanned too. Mexico, all of Latin America, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Guatemala, Honduras, I say that? Um, I, I mean, we're now releasing in Africa. Uh, Kenya just had their first screening last night. We have a million person screening taking place in a few weeks in Pakistan. We are releasing in Aruba, the Dominican Republic, uh, an island I've never even heard of, the Faroe Islands. Didn't know where that was, had to look it up on a map. It is close to the Netherlands, in case you don't know. The Netherlands, another place where Unplanned is releasing. We're releasing it throughout the UK, um, Romania, Bulgaria, I, I mean, everywhere. It's going everywhere. And guys, it's not because of me. It's not because of my story. It's because our society has been lied to about abortion for far too long. And people are finally rising up and saying, we want the truth. No matter how ugly it is, no matter how offensive that truth is, that's what we want. This story is about God turning something so broken into something beautiful because of him. You know, I look at my life from 10 years ago when I left. It's been almost 10, October. It will be 10 years since I left Planned Parenthood. And I look at my life then. I was confused. I, I didn't know where I stood on the majority of, of moral issues. I knew I, I didn't like abortion, but I... I, I didn't know if I was really pro-life. I didn't want to be one of you guys. <laughs> and I look at where I am now. When I left Planned Parenthood, I had one child. Now I have eight. I was confused and broken and unhealed, and I look now, and because of God's infinite and honestly scandalous mercy for all of us, I am healed, restored, and made new. And that's what God wants for all of us. That's what he wants for our society he wants to bring about conversion of the masses. I mean, I don't know. I think God loves a good conversion story. <laughs> we see it all over the Bible, right? I think he loves conversion. I think he actively seeks out the one who is lost. And heaven rejoices when that one is found. And that's what this movement must be about. It must be about conversion of heart. Conversion for the women who are walking into abortion facilities, for those who are confused about what their next decision will be for mothers who are hurting, who are overwhelmed. It must be about conversion for them and how we speak to them, our language, how we love them. That's what turns hearts because the way we speak is representative of how Jesus lives in us. So conversion of hearts for the women, but also conversion of hearts for the fathers. I believe one of the primary antidotes to abortion is fatherhood. But church, we have failed in this area.
We have failed to step up and be mentors, be role models for our young people who are flailing, who don't know who they are. Parents, for some reason, have, have, have given over their moral authority to society. And friends, that has been the greatest failed social experiment of our time. People don't know who they are anymore. It's a world of confusion. It's a world of chaos. And God did not come to bring us chaos. He came to bring us clarity. But I believe that we as a society have strayed so far away from God's path, we can no longer see clearly. We've been afraid, church. We've been afraid to speak up. We've been afraid to offend. You know, 60% of women having abortions are coming from our churches. 60%. Guys, that's on us. Somehow we as a body of believers have made made it appear that the doors of the abortion clinic are open and more accepting of a sinner than the doors of our local church. I was talking to a pastor one time. And uh, he said, well, we don't have the problem of abortion in our church. (laughs) And I was like, hey, listen, just in case you didn't know, every single person that sits in that congregation, sinner. Every single one of them. Every single one of us. We all have issues. We all have sin. We just sin differently. But these women need to hear, these men need to hear that there is nothing, there is no sin that can separate you from the love of Christ when you turn to him. And I'm not sure we've been doing a good enough job of spreading that message. We need to pray for conversion of politicians. Those who disagree with us, those who disagree with God's word. I scroll through Facebook sometimes and I see, you know, one out of every 10 posts is some complaint about politics or the government or something. And I think to myself, I wonder what our society would look like if we spent as much time in prayer as we do complaining about things we can't change on social media. We need to be praying. You know, I'm standing in front of you today as a testament to the power of conversion. No one is beyond the power of conversion because no one is beyond the power of Jesus Christ. And that means anyone. Anyone. Politicians, people in your family, people you go to church with, people you meet on the street. Jesus Every single one of them was created in the image and likeness of Christ. We should try to see Jesus when we see those around us who we disagree with. I am so thankful that the people who prayed for me on the sidewalk 
continued to look at me and see a person who was made in the image and likeness of Christ. I am thankful that they did not condemn me. I'm thankful that they did not yell at me, that they did not call me names. I'm thankful for their grace because their grace pointed me to God's mercy. I really want to spend the rest of my time answering questions from you, hearing from you. I love Q&A. It's my favorite thing. So feel free to ask anything you want. Any question is on the table. Um, I'd love to, to hear from you and answer any burning questions you may have. Hi, Abby. Um, Hi. Tell us about your work with And Then There Were None. Sure. Um, so, let's see. My book, my book on plan was released in 2011, and I started getting emails from people, um, from, from clinic workers, from people who worked in the abortion industry. And they were uh, saying, you know, I picked up your book, I read it, I read it because I wanted to hate it. I read it as a critic, but I read it and I found truth, and I'm wondering if you can help me leave. And uh, I thought, sure, there's got to be an organization for that, you know, because the pro-life movement, we've got organizations for everything, right? So uh, I thought, yeah, there's got to be something out there. So I Googled, I made phone calls. There was nothing. There was nothing for people like me, people who may want to leave their jobs and find other employment, find healing, whatever it may be. And so, um, you know, my husband and I, we privately helped them as much as we could with the small networks we had at the time. And, you know, we got them out and everything. And uh, then, I, you know, I really started praying and I was like, God... You know, we've been at this for just over 40 years now at the time. And I was like, you know, this is a needed ministry. So if you could just place this burden on somebody's heart <laughs> to start a ministry for abortion workers, that would be awesome, right? And I kept praying, kept praying. And uh, finally, like, God was like, hey, dummy, like, it's you, right? And so um, I thought, oh, man, I, I didn't know how to start a nonprofit. I knew how to run one, but I didn't know how to start one. And so we just ventured out, got it started. We um, officially launched uh, in mid-2012, June of 2012. Um, we are an organization that provides comprehensive support to abortion clinic workers who want to leave their job. So comprehensive support to us looks like um, emotional support. We have uh, client managers who are all trained in trauma therapy and crisis intervention. Um, so all of our clients that come to us have a one-on-one -on -one relationship um, with, uh, with a client manager. Uh, we provide su spiritual support. You know, our end goal is to get these men and women into a relationship with Christ. So we want to, you know, help them get involved locally in a church, you know, whatever it may be. So we want to provide that, that form of healing as well, because we know true healing only comes through Christ. So we want to point them in that direction. We have professional licensed Christian therapists on staff with us. So um, for any workers that need some additional um, support, we are able to provide that for them at no cost. We provide tr transitional financial assistance. So once you realize, I got to get out of here, I got to get out of this job, um, we don't want 
money to be a reason that someone stays and continues in evil, right? The Bible says we are to turn and flee from evil. And so that's what we want to be able to, to help them do. And so we provide transitional financial support for them um, so that they're able to leave immediately. We have healing retreats for them. So we have a multi-phased um, healing retreat approach that they go to. We have a once a year retreat where anyone who has ever been on a retreat is able to come back together. Those are so fun and amazing. I mean, there's really, we, we call it our tribe. Um, there's just power in sharing experiences, you know, shared experiences, shared grief, uh, shared trauma, um, coming together and being in a safe place. We provide that for them as well. We also have um, legal services. So we have partnered with the Thomas More Society, which is a, a pro-life, pro-family um, legal group. And uh, they have attorneys in every state who have pledged to support our workers with any le legal trouble that they may have um, at no cost to the worker. So we really try to provide a, a comprehensive service for them. To date, we have helped just over 550 abortion workers leave their jobs. And um, we, have, we have helped seven full-time abortion doctors leave their jobs and come to Christ. So, um, so yeah, it's been really amazing. I mean, being able to witness transformation like that, I mean, you realize that you really are witnessing a miracle. And uh, it's, it's an honor just to be on that journey with so many people. All right, good luck. And the man here had a question. Terry. Um, hi, Abby. Hi. Uh, truly enjoyed your movie. Thank you. I have a two-fold question. First of all, how did the movie do in terms of making an impact? And did you expect that? And then second of all, from a performing artist's perspective, I'm a poet as well as a Christian author. I actually just wrote a poem about the unborn. And so how do you think the performing artist community can help make an impact on exposing this issue um, mm -hmm. across America as artists, as performers, as the arts itself? Sure. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so... Um, First question was what? <laughs> I, I got hung up on the performing art. The impact, the impact of the film. Okay, sorry, I'm like mom of eight, trains like right off the bat. Um, okay, so the impact of the film was tremendous. And, you know, you just never know. I mean, when I wrote Unplanned, I was like, okay, well, my mom will buy a copy. <laughs> My grandma will buy a copy, you know, and then it ended up being a bestseller. Um, so I'm always surprised, <laughs> you know, um, but the, the impact was great. I mean, every day that it was in a U.S. theater, every single day I was waking up to messages from people saying, I walked into your film Pro-Choice, pro I walked out pro-life. Um, I think a lot of people, particularly young people, they believe that the pro-choice position is one of compassion. So when they're actually able to see the true victim of abortion, when they're able to see this baby fighting for its life, they recognize, wait, compassionate for who? right? It's not compassionate for the child in the womb who's the primary victim of abortion. And so, um, you know, I, I think that it, it made a huge impact because it just showed the truth. I mean, that's it. Um, and it's been impactful. I mean, everywhere, it's everywhere that it has released so far. I mean, I get messages pretty much every day from people saying, I saw the film, I had no idea, you know, or people saying, you know, I was pro-life, but I never really did anything. I was never really active. And now I have just this urgency, this fire to do something. Um, so to me, that's a huge success as well. When, when we were releasing Unplanned, a lot of critics were like, oh, well, 
you know, uh, it's just going to be a bunch of Christians that go watch your film. And I was like, well, fan flipping tastic because if just half of the people who sat in, in church pews every Sunday were actually active in fighting to end abortion, we would have already ended this thing, right? So we needed the church to wake up, and hopefully this was sort of a wake-up call for a lot of people. Um, you know, we've there's been a lot of babies that have been saved, um, thanks be to God, because of that, that reality of abortion being shown. So um, I, I, you know, Prayerfully, uh, I hope that it continues to have a huge impact across the across the globe. Um, so, you know, we have a problem in the uh, performing artists and in Hollywood. We have a problem there because so many of them have bought the lie of Planned Parenthood, and they have bought the lie of choice. You know, we now have, you know. Uh, actresses and you know people coming out and saying well I wouldn't have the amazing career I have now if I hadn't have aborted two of my children right um, I mean it's sickness right I mean it's sin and it's it we're sick with sin and but proclaiming that is this as, as if they're proud of it um, it's just it's evil honestly and uh, you know a couple years ago, they there was uh, they came out with these necklaces that said 1973 on them, and so Selena Gomez and all of these um, all of these musicians and you know authors and uh, movie stars started wearing these necklaces that said 1973 in support of Roe v. Wade, in support of the legalization of abortion, and um, it's just it seems to be trendy now to talk about your abortion publicly and to talk about killing your babies. Um, and so, you know, we need people in that community. I look at people like Patricia Heaton, um, who is very vocal about her pro-life beliefs. Um, I look at NFL players, uh, Benjamin Watson, uh, Matt Burke, you know, these people who are coming out who have big platforms and they're speaking, but gosh, there's so few of them. I mean, compared to the other side, right? Um, but we need more of them. We need people in that community being willing to rise up and speak out. And um, it reminds me, okay, so my favorite singer ever is Stevie Nicks. Okay, and uh, my favorite band, Fleetwood Mac, and um, you know when she she has that song called Sarah. Nobody knew until a few years ago that that song was about a baby that she aborted, and then later regretted that decision and wrote a song in honor of her aborted child. And so I think, and that was so profound for people. Right? And people were like, oh, my God, I loved that song for so long. I thought it was about a woman. I thought it was about a, you know, a friend of hers or something. No, it was about her child that she chose to abort. And it wrecked her. It, like, ravaged her, right, because of it. I think we need uh, performers coming out with things that are not so, like, you know, okay, what rhymes with abortion, right? But, <laughs> like, more, <laughs> you know, like, more subtle talking about a culture of life, talking about a sanctity of human life in a more subtle way so that people will look at it and go, man, I, I love this song, right? I love this poem. I love this whatever. Um, and then, you know, you can sort of drop the bomb and say, well, this is actually about, you know, whatever. So I think that's, that's sort of my feeling about it. Um, we need to infiltrate the culture with positive messaging, um, particularly through song and, and uh, writing and poetry and, you know, different forms of art, different uh, mediums. And so I think, uh, I think that your voice is very powerful, and, you know, I would encourage you to 
keep going. I know sometimes it probably feels like you're in the minority, and you probably are, honestly, but uh, but we need strong vo- Everybody said, Patricia Heaton, if you come out as pro-life, you will never work again. And that was a big, fat lie, right? She's still very beloved in Hollywood. Um, and there are others like her. So, you know, Justin Bieber came out as pro-life. Um, and everybody loves the Bieber, you know? So, um, Eminem, the real Slim Shady, came out as being against abortion, right? And, and people still, some people, you know, still like him. So... You know, he's still popular, so I think we, we, we make ourselves feel like, well, if, if we do this, then, uh, you know, oh, well, it's, it's fear, right? It's fear-based, and, and God did not give us a spirit of fear, and so we have to just move in boldness. Uh, yes, thank I'm you. I'm making eye contact with everybody. There's seven people that have winked, blown kisses at me. <laughs> One of six. Here we go. Okay. Abby, in your movie, uh, there's a scene that's very compelling with the chemical abortion. And we are faced in California right now, perhaps at this moment in Sacramento, looking at a bill, Senate Bill 24, which would institute chemical abortions on all state university campuses. Yes. Would you consider it? It's very likely it will pass because the majority of our legislators are controlled by Planned Parenthood. Would you consider calling the uh, Governor Gavin Newsom and telling your story and inviting him to see unplanned unplanned and to vote no on Senate Bill 24? Hey, I'm always up for a challenge. I'll, you know, I'm willing to call anybody, to make any phone call, to send clips of the film to people and say, this is what you're supporting, you know, this is what it actually looks like. It's not some, you know, bloodless event that takes place in the privacy of your bathroom. I mean, this is a horrific experience. Women deserve better than that. Their babies deserve better than to be flushed down toilets. Um, I mean, I'm willing to do whatever I can um, to help, yeah. Hi, Abby. I'm Carl Fikensher. I'm a Lutheran pastor and professor from Fort Wayne, Indiana, where the film oh, did very well. Yes. And uh, we enjoyed it. It did, yeah. yeah. It did, you bet. Um, we've seen the film, and we, we've seen, obviously, uh, the way the film depicted uh, inside workings <laughs> of Planned Parenthood. Um, I, I'd still love to hear from you. Uh, either highlighting particular things that were in the film, uh, you know, y- your boss, if that was accurate, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, if, if you would describe some of the things for us, yeah. live and in person. And with that also, the next question, uh, has uh, Planned Parenthood or anyone else, uh, besides the, the immediate legal action that we saw in the film, tried to do anything to challenge the actual facts of what was depicted there have sure. they sought to say no that that never happened that never happens things like that yeah okay great question so um yeah my boss in the film that's exactly how she was um she was very um abortion focused she had been there for many many years um i think that you know there are times in all of our lives where we are, uh, we, we, we come to a crossroad, right? And we either choose to continue down the road that we're going or we choose righteousness. And if we continue to, to, if we choose to go down the road that we're continuing to go down, every time we make that choice, our heart becomes a little more hardened. And she had been confronted with that crossroad for over 30 years you know, those crossroads over and over and over again. And so her heart had become very numb, very hardened, her conscience very, very dulled. Um, I pray for her every day. 
Um, I know that she retired from Planned Parenthood, so, um, but, you know, she was a, a, a person who was hurting. She uh, was raised Catholic, uh, left, her, left her faith, uh, then became an atheist. She uh, was, um, was married, had two children, left her husband, married a woman, um, so there's a lot of a lot of pain um, in her life, and and so that's what really prompts me to continue to pray for her that she would just be released from those burdens, you know, that are really keeping her chained. Um, you know, everybody else in the film, I mean, it was it was pretty accurate. I mean, Ashley portrayed me well, but honestly, she played a very nicer version of who I really was. Uh, They were very gracious, I guess I would say, in the film. Um, But, uh, yeah, I mean, the relationship I had with people on the sidewalk, I mean, that that was accurate. It wasn't necessarily Sean and Mary Lisa. I didn't have, like, a super close relationship to them. As it was portrayed, it was, like, five or six people, um, but that would have been too confusing to have all these different, you know, characters and people I'm communicating with. So to make, to make things make more sense, uh, they sort of condensed it to, to two people, you know, Sean and Mary Lisa, which worked nicely because I think unintentionally, Unplanned sort of showed a love story between myself and my husband. So pairing that with, you know, a couple on the other side of the fence was, was nice. Um, so yeah, I mean, they did a really good job of, of being accurate and, and being authentic, you know, in the film. Uh, there was one thing that I wish they would have put in that, um, they didn't. And, uh, it was when I, when I called my parents to tell them I had left the clinic, um, they were actually on vacation in Colorado. And so I, I called them and my mom answered the phone and I said, Hey, what are y'all doing? And she said, Oh, we're driving through Estes park. And I said, uh, can you pull over? And she's like, what's wrong? Right. I mean, like immediately, like what is happening? You know, she like goes into a panic and, uh, I was like, nothing. And she's like, what's wrong with grace? You know, she like thinks there's something wrong with my kid and all. And I'm like, mom, Everything is fine. Just can you pull over? So she's like, Mike, Mike, pull over, pull over. You know, and and then he's like, what's happening? You know, so it's like a, it's like chaos, right, in the cab of their truck. And um, and so I said, put me on speakerphone. And so she puts me on speakerphone. She's like, what, what is it? Tell us right now. And I said, um, I just resigned from Planned Parenthood, and I wanted you guys to know. And my mom, there was all of this hollering and, and praise Jesus and crying and, and all of this hoopla, right, happening. And all of a sudden it stopped and my dad said, honey, do you need me to send you any money? <laughs> and, I, and I wish that would have been in the film because that's such a dad, right? Like... He's like, baby, I love you. I'm so proud of you. Can I send you money? Like, you know, that's, you know, and that just shows, like, the heart of a man, right, that he is forever. No matter if his baby girl is 20 or 30 years old, like, the heart of a father is always to provide and to protect. And so I I love that, and I so I like sharing that story. I sort of wish it would have been in the film, but... Um, but yeah, I mean, everything was really was really well done, and everything was really accurate. Um, second question was, by oh, Planned Parenthood. Did not that. No, they, you know, ABC actually ran a story on the film, and that I think took them aback. You know, they were hoping this was just going to like blow over and nobody's going to watch it and it'll be fine and it'll just go away, you know. 
they did not expect it to run in theaters 14 weeks. They did not expect it to make $20 million at the box office. They did not expect it to go internationally and thwart their efforts in other countries. Um, so, And they did not expect any secular media to pick it up. Um, so when ABC picked it up and they did this amazing story on it, the woman who did the story um, is a Christian and saw the film and loved it, even though she couldn't tell me that. And um, she ended up writing this beautiful story on it. She did reach out to Planned Parenthood to get their response. They had not responded to anybody else. But in their response, they just simply said something like, uh, well, we think that the way... Uh, patient, the way that our healthcare services are portrayed in the film is is not true. I mean, that was all they said. They didn't even like try to. No, they didn't say like that's not what abortion looks like, or you know that's not what really happens in the clinic, or we don't have abortion quotas, or none of that. It was just like, well, don't listen to her. You know, it was just sort of like that. You know, and. Um, quotas are real, real. Uh, and I think that Planned Parenthood has been um, (laughs) so I started you know talking about things like quotas and I started talking about I, I posted a Uh, Well, I started talking about awards that Planned Parenthood would give out if you meet your quota and all this kind of stuff, and Planned Parenthood denied it. And they said, nope, uh, that that doesn't happen. And um, I wait for them to do that. That's strategic. (laughs) Um, I wait for them to deny it, to say what they're going to say, and then I provide the proof. Um, and then, so with the awards, I provided proof of an award that had been given to a clinic for exceeding their abortion quota. And so then they were like, oh, well, okay, yeah, we, okay, we do have abortion quotas, right? Um, that has happened multiple times. Uh, Planned Parenthood was going around telling everybody they provided mammograms, for instance. And I said, there is not one mammogram machine in any Planned Parenthood clinic across the country. We knew that to be a fact because you have to have a specific license to run a mammogram machine. And we did a FOIA public information request in every state. Planned Parenthood did not have a license for any mammogram machine. So we had the um, facts to back it up, not just my anecdotal experience. And so... um, Anyway, uh, so I had I kept saying that, and Cecile Richards goes on Joy Behar and says, you know, women will lose access to mammograms, and so, uh, and then Barack Obama said it. You know, everybody was saying it, and I was fed up. So I just for fun started a an event on Facebook called "Call Planned Parenthood to Schedule Your Imaginary Mammogram Day." <laughs> And uh, I think you called, Patty. There were a lot of people there. And it took off, right? It, like, I just did it as a joke. Ended up making it onto Drudge. And so it was, like, all over the news. We had tens of thousands of people calling Planned Parenthood. Men calling, like, <laughs> I need a mammogram. Or, like, my wife needs a mammogram, you know. And so um, all these people were calling. Tens of thousands of people were calling. And uh, they finally had to come out with a statement that said, no, okay, we actually don't. So, look, here's the thing. I really love people, and I try to love them well, but I think I've made it very clear over the past 10 years that I'm not an enemy to be trifled with. (laughs) And if... If I make a claim about something, I have the evidence to back it up every single time. I may not come out with it right away. I may hold on to it because I'm very, I try to be very strategic. Um, 
But I think Planned Parenthood and other organizations have realized I'm not an enemy that they want to make. And, and so they generally don't bother me anymore. They pretty much leave me alone. And if they had the evidence to prove that what I was saying was untrue, they would have had me in court years ago. But they can't prove it because it's true. Right, we're, we're back here. Uh, I think I was accused of only calling on men. So I will okay, all offer. right. Lady, raise your hand if you'd like to speak. Okay, uh, da, 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 okay gotcha. And uh, we'll get there next. But I do have a man before because he raised his hand first. And then I'll get over the ladies that just Sexist. Raised hand over there. Sexist here. Sexist here. Or, <laughs> Pastor Espinosa. Thank you, Abby, so yes. much. Uh, AJ Espinosa, many thanks on behalf of the Espinosa family. I, I was thinking about uh, just how surreal it must be to, to watch a movie, to watch other people portray your life. And, and just think about, I mean, like, to me, that seems about as bizarre as, um, you know, uh, imagining what your own funeral must be like. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's just you're watching something, and it's just like that's really weird seeing it uh, from this perspective. And, and so I guess I wanted to ask, I, I imagine to, to look at the events of your own life and the, your own story, which you know so well, but to see it from a very different perspective, like a, like a mirror being held up, was there anything that, that came through to you that kind of maybe surprised you and you said, I never even thought of it like that? Or, you know, or maybe something even in the, the way that the actors handled it, like, yeah, that's, I, I didn't even think that that might have been going through that person's mind, or I, I, maybe that's, that was true of me and I didn't even think that. Is there, was there anything like that uh, as that kind of, kind of weird out-of-body experience for yourself? I, I had to apologize to my parents um, I knew that it had been hard for them, you know, to um, see me go down that path. I knew that they had been praying. I, I knew that. Um, but I don't know. There's something visually about seeing it and seeing how difficult that was for them and, and um, just seeing the, the turmoil that they were in, you know, hearing the conversations that they must have been having. Um, that, that was, that really broke my heart that I had, I had done that to my parents. And, um, and then knowing that my parents, even through all of that, continued to love me and support me, even though they didn't support what I was doing. Um, so I had to, I had to really take a step back and apologize to my parents. Um, I had to apologize to my parents for not trusting them when I did have my unplanned pregnancies. Um, because I see now how much that affects them, knowing that they lost two grandchildren. Um, I never thought about that, honestly, you know. Now when I talk to girls, uh, a lot of times they'll say, you know, oh, my parents, they're going to kill me if they find out I'm pregnant. And, and particularly if they're girls who, you know, parents are in church and, and you know, things like that. And they're like, no, I can't embarrass my parents. And that was, that was my way of thinking. You know, my dad's a deacon in his Baptist church. Like, I can't embarrass my parents with my sin. And so I often tell those girls when I talk to them, you know, your parents expect you to stray from the path that they have set for you because that's part of being a kid. But I ask them, do you think that your parents would be more disappointed to find out that, you know, you messed up, but there's a baby coming? Or do you think they'd be more disappointed to find out that you never gave them a chance to fight for their grandbaby? And they always know the answer. And if somebody would have asked me that, I would have known the answer. Um, 
And that's really why I, I talk about the role of the church so much. Because I didn't feel like there was anybody in my life that I could go to for Christian counsel, for wise counsel. And so I took things into my own hands, and we know that <laughs> that's bound to be a mess, right? <laughs> we do things on our own. And um, so that was definitely one thing. I, I definitely had to, um, which I had before, but really in a, even more so <laughs> had to apologize to my husband um, and to thank him because, man, uh, it would have been easy for him to leave, and he didn't. And I was listening to him one day, and uh, he was doing an interview, and he said to someone, they said, you know, why would you marry somebody who worked at Planned Parenthood when you were pro-life? And I heard him answer. He said, uh, you know, I always knew that her job could be temporary, but I knew I wanted to love her forever. And, you know, I think that's, that's the type of love that, that Christ has for us. You know, he watches us make mistakes, and he probably rolls his eyes at me a lot, and he just keeps loving us, you know, and it's, it's just really beautiful. It's really powerful, and um, I think it's a good message to send, too, especially now. I mean, marriage is in really a state of chaos in our society, and I think that that's a a story that that's a message that needs to be shared, you know, that you can make it. I mean, you can make it. Even if your wife works at an abortion clinic and you're pro-life, you can make it through whatever, through infidelity, through, you can make it. And um, I'm sorry, I don't have, I don't have a lot of knowledge of the Missouri Synod doctrine or anything, but do you guys have like sacraments? Okay, so what are those? We especially celebrate full communion and holy baptism. Okay. In our confessions, we also acknowledge absolution. Okay. And uh, holy ordination uh, that gives the word of God. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, y'all are like almost Catholic. Right? (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, yeah. We're like little C. We're all Catholic, right? Like (laughs) universal. Um, (laughs) <laughs> so, uh, I heard somebody say one time, you know, they were talking about the sacraments that we celebrate in the Catholic Church and, and that you guys celebrate here too. And they said, you know, <clears throat> when you take the sacrament of communion, do you think that God ever messes that up? You think that he's ever like, oh, no, not, I didn't mean that. That was, right? No, of course, right? It's always perfect. It's always complete. When you, you know, take the sacrament of, of absolution, of confession, you ever think God's like, oh, no, I got that one wrong? No. But yet we as Christians even within our church, and please hear me, I'm, I'm not saying this to shame anybody. I, I am a divorced woman. I was divorced and before I married Doug, so I'm not being judgy at all. Okay, I've lived it. But why would we ever think that the sacrament of marriage, that God messed that up when he brought two people together? He doesn't screw up sacraments. <laughs> They are meant to be forever. They are meant to be permanent. But we just, we have, we have embraced this idea that, well, the sacrament of marriage, I mean, if it doesn't work, then eh, we'll just throw it out the window. We would never throw any other sacrament out the window. But we do with marriage. And I think that that's why our churches need to be really taking a stand, you know, about the sacrament of marriage, the traditional marriage, what it means that marriage can be hard. It can be a struggle, right? But you stick it out because you have, you have partaken in a sacrament 
and that is holy and it is beautiful and God doesn't make a mistake. So that's just sort of my, that's my soapbox there on marriage. But they turned you off. Oh, thank you so much. I can hear it and I can repeat it, so. It's not, and then there were none is no relation to the Agatha Christie novel, although I do enjoy Agatha Christie novels, but no, it's not. Yes. Yes. We definitely need churches. We need people of the church in front of these clinics. You are there to offer hope to women who feel like there is none left. And, uh, you know, David B. Wright, who was the founder of 40 Days for Life, he, um, he says all the time, he says, every day that an abortion clinic is open with an empty sidewalk, there might as well be a big sign on that clinic that says, this clinic is open with the permission of the Christian church. I mean, that is convicting, that is powerful, and it's true. If there was a clinic that opened up that said, we will humanely euthanize toddlers up to the age of four, people would be, I mean, there would be whatever. People would be doing whatever they had to do, right? Right? to stop these children from being killed. Yet the majority of the time I drive by Planned Parenthood clinics, I drive by FPA clinics, I drive by other abortion facilities, and there is not a soul out there. And that is a reflection on us as the church, that we have been silent, we have been apathetic, we have just allowed this to happen right under our noses. And a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to go out to the sidewalk. It feels weird. It feels uncomfortable. Yes, as it should. It should feel uncomfortable to stand outside of a clinic and watch women walk into a facility to take the lives of their own children. The moment that that is no longer uncomfortable for us should tell us that we have a problem in our own heart. It should be hard. We should be emotionally drained when we leave that sidewalk because we have just prayed our guts out. But just because something's hard, just because something's uncomfortable, doesn't mean that we don't do it. I mean, Christians are not here to be comfortable. We're here to be uncomfortable. And so I'm not sure what it's going to take, but I know that if we really want to make abortion unthinkable in our society, it is going to start and end with the church. I believe that with every fiber of my being. So we need you out there 30 minutes an hour, and not just during 40 days, because guess what? Abortions happen just about every day in the United States, and especially here in California. You know, we don't even know how many abortions take place in California because they are not required to report. 
We don't know how many late-term abortions are being committed. We don't know how many first trimester, second trimester. We don't know how many babies are being born alive and left to suffocate in, in emesis basins. We don't know. Because they're not even required to report here. They're not even required to report those numbers. Because it's a legislative issue. Um, we don't even know the toll that abortion has taken here in your state. But I know that the answer, one of the answers, is us showing up on that sidewalk and offering hope and offering literally a lifeline to that child in the womb. Women do not walk into abortion clinics. The whole idea of being pro-choice is such a lie. Women do not walk into abortion clinics saying, I am so excited to exercise my right to choose today. Women have abortions because they feel like there is no other choice. They feel like they're out of choices. They are manipulated. They are coerced. 60, a study showed that 64% of women who have had abortion state they felt coerced or forced into making that decision. That is not choice. That is abuse. We have to do better. We have to stand against all forms of abuse. And what is taking place inside of those clinics is abuse. It is exploitation. It is manipulation. It is death. Under no other circumstance would this country allow such horror. But we allow it every single day in abortion clinics right down the road from us. Yes, I'd ma'am. like you to address the, you alluded to it earlier, but the lie and where it originated that Planned Parenthood is in its very name perpetuating. And that's the lie that they're allowing people to plan their parenthood. When in reality, as I glean from the film that you solidified the truth for me, they're all about ending lives. It has nothing to do with let us help you unless you tell me differently. I think I understand it's not Planned Parenthood. And who, who started the lie that we hear in the mass media today that that's what they're about? Oh, they're about pap smears and birth control and mammograms. If what I saw today and what I'm hearing is right, that's not what they are. No, and so, where did that come from? So Planned Parenthood was actually founded in 1916 uh, by a woman named Margaret Sanger, who was, uh, yeah, she was a uh, eugenist. She, I mean, I want to be clear with you, Planned Parenthood was founded for one reason and one reason alone, and that was to eliminate the minority population through easy access to abortion and birth control. Okay, that, I mean, that's it. She wrote about it publicly. She did interviews about it. That was the goal of Planned Parenthood. And today, we see her dreams coming to fruition as currently in the United States, there are almost as many African-American babies being killed by abortion as there are being born. So we have a problem, right? We have a problem in the United States with abortion and Planned Parenthood selling abortion, promoting abortion. But it didn't always used to be that way. So Margaret Sanger, uh, you know, she founded Planned Parenthood. It was under this guise of, you know, contraception, helping women plan their families, all this kind of stuff. But she did do these very brazen interviews where she said things like, the most merciful thing a large family can do for one of its infant members is to kill it, okay? So she did do these interviews, was very brazen with her words, and um, but then for a while, Planned Parenthood sort of separated themselves from her because they were like, eh, she's sort of a lunatic, okay? Like, she's sort of crazy. 
So for a while, Planned Parenthood had separated themselves from, from the legacy of Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger ended up dying. They separated themselves even more so. And for, for several decades, Planned Parenthood was actually against abortion. So in the, in the 50s and early 60s, they actually put out pamphlets talking about the dangers of abortion and how abortion was the deliberate killing, they used the word, killing of a child, okay? So there was a time where Planned Parenthood was absolutely against abortion. Then in the mid to late 60s, abortion became legal in several states, Okay, New York was one of them. And they realized, wait a minute, we can make money off of this. Okay? So they put all of their they put all of their brochures in the trash and they started talking more and more about abortion rights. And that was when we had um, the, the man, Dr. Bernard Nathanson, who was a renowned abortion doctor in New York. He aborted over 75,000 babies in the womb, uh, including one of his own children. He started a group called NARAL, okay, which is still active today. So NARAL was a, an activism group for the legalization of abortion throughout the United States. Dr. Bernard Nathanson in the 80s had a profound conversion and became pro-life. Okay, you might have heard of the little documentary called Silent Scream. Silent Scream was created by Dr. Bernard Nathanson in 1984. Ultrasound technology was really just sort of taking off. We had never seen the baby in the womb before, right? And so there was a lot of ignorance surrounding what, what was in the womb, what was in the womb, what did it look like, was it just cells, was it a baby, was it formed, we didn't know, okay? Dr. Bernard Nathanson ended up doing a documentary series called Silent Scream, and he showed a baby in the womb, and during the abortion procedure, he shows the baby's mouth opening and closing as if it's screaming. That film that came out in 1984 caused a mass exodus of abortion providing physicians to leave their jobs and turn their backs on abortion, okay? At that time, even though Dr. Nathanson, Dr. Nathanson was one of the people, there, was, there were two doctors, him and another man, that founded, co-founded NARAL. He admitted in the 80s when he had his conversion experience that they lied, that they lied about all of the medical complications that happened in back alley abortions. They lied about the number of women who died in back alley abortions. They lied about the, all of it in order to get Roe passed through the Supreme Court. Okay? When Dr. Nathanson had a conversion, Dr. Nathanson was raised Jewish. Jewish. He had a conversion. When he had a conversion to the pro-life movement, he was a pro-life atheist. Upon his death, he had accepted Christ, was a Christian, and had a full conversion into faith. So when I say that no one's beyond the power of conversion, I really mean it. Because we see it in the lives of these people who helped to even solidify Roe v. Wade. Well, look at Jane Roe, right? Norma McCorvey. Norma Corvey was used by Sarah Weddington and their other attorneys. She was poor, she was uneducated, and the abortion industry used her as Jane Roe to help pass Roe v. Wade, right? In the 80s, Norma McCorvey had a, a profound conversion experience, ended up becoming pro-life, eventually becoming a Christian, and she lived her whole life with that burden of Roe v. Wade. And she ended up passing away a couple years ago. So we have seen sort of the implosion of Roe v. Wade, right? People were manipulated, they were abused. Dr. Nathanson talked about how they lied over and over again in order to pass Roe. And so now we are in the stages where we are looking to the Supreme Court to take a look at Roe v. Wade 
and to say, was this a good product to put on the market? I believe that when they look at the scientific evidence, when they look at the medical advances that have been made, I mean, when Roe v. Wade became law, a baby could not survive outside of the womb if it was born below 30 weeks, probably below 32, 33 weeks. We did not have the medical advancement, right? Now we see babies being born at 21, 21 weeks, surviving, thriving, healthy outside of the womb. Our morality cannot continue to change as medical advancement continues to grow, right? And so now we're looking for, and I personally believe it will be heartbeat legislation that causes the Supreme Court to look at Roe, to reevaluate Roe, and the goal is to recall abortion, to say this was a bad product. It hurt a lot of people, and we are now taking it off the market. But Roe v. Wade in itself was founded on lies. It was pushed through the Supreme Court based on lies, and we know that now. Um, but Planned Parenthood, once they realized that they could get rich quick off of abortion, they changed their messaging. And that messaging has continued to change. For many years, it was, you know, well, it's just a mass of tissue. It's just a blob of cells, whatever. Then ultrasound technology came around. Pregnancy centers started offering ultrasounds to women. 60% of women who have abortions already have other children at home. So these aren't women who are ignorant to prenatal development. They know. So then Planned Parenthood had to change their talking points again. So now it was no longer a mass of tissue. Now it was... Well, abortion is a sacrificial decision that a mother makes in order to care for her current family and her future family. So then it turned into, oh, well, I'm, I'm, do, I'm making a merciful decision by choosing abortion. And then you factor in what's taken place with the whole aborted baby parts scandal and then they could look at women and say, well, you know what, don't worry about having an abortion because we're going to actually use it for good. We're going to take the aborted body parts of your baby and we're going to sell them to a research company and they're going to be able to cure Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or whatever, which has been a big lie. There have been zero advances take place from embryonic stem cell tissue. All of the major advancements that we have had in stem cell research have come from umbilical cord stem cells or have come from adult stem cells. None of them have come from embryonic aborted baby tissue. But it's just all a lie. And that's what happens with a lie. The more you speak a lie, the more people begin to believe it is true. And that's what has happened. The media has helped to spread this lie. But now it's starting to sort of unravel. Planned Parenthood's becoming more brazen. They just fired their, le their latest president because she wanted to focus more on health care and, and take the focus away from abortion. And they said, get out of here. We want to focus on abortion. We look at their, their, um, their annual reports, Planned Parenthood's annual reports over the past 10 years, the only service that has continued to rise is abortion. Every other service they offer, well woman exams, STD testings, birth control, all of that has continued to decline. Now Planned Parenthood has recently, within the past five years, opened up abortion-only clinics. So there are five clinics right now that are Planned Parenthood clinics that only provide abortion six days a week. You can't go there to get a pap smear. You can't go there to get a breast exam. You can't go there to get STD testing or a pregnancy test. They only provide abortions 100% of the time. So I feel like, I mean, at least they're being honest now. I mean, I would rather them be honest than stand behind this lie that we're for other women's health care services because they're not. They, if they really were, 
President Donald Trump recently defunded Planned Parenthood of $60 million, took them out of the Title X funding program. If they really cared about preventative health care services for women, they would have said, you know what? We care so much about the health care of women, we're going to stop doing abortions so that we can continue to receive this money. That's all they had to do. It just can't go to abortion providers. If they would have said, you know what, we care too much about cervical cancer screenings for women, for low-income women, we're not going to take the money. We're going to, I mean, we're going to take the money. We're going to stop doing abortions. We need this money to advance health care for women. That's all they had to do. They didn't. They doubled down and said, we're not even going to fight for it. We're not even going to take this to court because we don't care. We're getting enough money from abortion, and they are not a health care provider. It's not what they're about. That's why they're trying to convince everybody that abortion is health care. They say it over and over again, abortion is health care, abortion is health care, because that's really the only health care they want to end up providing in the end. So I hope that answers your question. It was pretty lengthy. So <laughs> sorry. Okay. All right. Who's next? I am. Hi, Abby. Here, Patty. Oh, Patty. Okay. Hey. <laughs> First of all, I want to tell you how much we appreciate you. you, how much I've watched you over the last few years and how you've matured and grown well, in, I hope so. in grace and wisdom. It's I hope been it awesome. hasn't gotten, gone backwards. Yeah, that no, would be bad. it has not. Um, I want to ask why and how can Planned Parenthood say that only 3% of what they do is abortion? Great. How can they get away with that lie? Yes. And number two, that's kind okay. of a two. Oh, my gosh. Everybody has a two-part yeah, question. I know. I, okay, I, no, go I, ahead. I'm just kidding. I'm just giving you our time. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> and then number two is back to Dr. Leona Wynn. Yes. Now, I, I know that you tried to reach out to her. Has she responded? She is not. Um, I reached out to her privately and publicly, as we did also through and then the Renan, reached out to her privately and publicly. We have not heard from her. Um, and we wouldn't broadcast it if we did, but I can honestly say we haven't heard from her. <laughs> so um, we continue to pray for her. We, we pray that one day she will reach out um, because we definitely do understand uh, what, what she's gone through and the betrayal uh, that she's experienced. Um, the 3% number. Okay, so it's, so it's pretty easy um, once somebody breaks it down for you. Okay. So Planned Parenthood engages in something I call creative math, okay? It's like, sort of like Common Core. Okay, so, so you might try to teach their kids Common Core math. I mean, it is like, I had to go watch a tutorial to figure out how to teach my kid how to multiply like eight times four. I was like, I don't... I mean, it's 32. I don't, I don't know how else to tell you. I don't know. Anyway. Okay. So, it is 32, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. So, uh, so, what they do is they have separate billing codes. So, for every woman that comes in, let's say that I walk into Planned Parenthood and I would like to get... Um, a pap smear, I would like to get a breast exam, I would like to get a gonorrhea, a chlamydia test, and I would like to get 10 packs of birth control pills, okay, which I would never do because I'm against birth control, but anyway, let's say that that's what I was doing, okay, I walk in for one visit and I'm going to receive 14 services at that visit, yes? Everybody agrees. Everybody follow me? Okay. What Planned Parenthood does is they take each one of those services, those 14 services, and they do something called unbundling. So each service looks like an individual visit for that patient. So it looks like I went in 14 separate times. Okay? Make sense? Okay. 
Then they do the opposite for abortion. So for abortion, you have many different codes that you're billing. Ultrasound, RH lab testing, abortion procedure itself, uh, vital signs. You have different things that you're billing. They bill those as they should bill family planning. They put all of those together, and you have one visit with, let's say, 20 procedure codes. They do not unbundle the abortion visits. They do unbundle family planning. So we will actually never know the real numbers unless Planned Parenthood was willing to release their raw data of unduplicated patients. Because one patient could potentially look like, if she has gone there, let's say, for four visits throughout the year, for yeast infection, UTI, for whatever she may have, birth control visits, whatever, it could look like she has been there 30 to 40 times during that year when maybe she's only had three to four visits. But they will never release that, those unduplicated numbers because then we would have the real numbers and we would know that in reality about 40 to 50 percent of the services they provide involve abortion. Um, but they'll never tell us what those numbers are. And for some reason, nobody is in, in Congress or whenever, whenever they, you know, there have been times when they have been questioned, right? They've had, you know, congressional hearings and things, and nobody ever asked them, give me the number of unduplicated patients you've had. I'm like, Ted Cruz, ask the question, right? Like, because then they would have to answer. They'd be under oath. But that's the number that we actually need. No, you'd have to ask them. Hi. Um, I just first well, want to say thank you for being bold enough to tell your story. Thank you. Um, I'm always amazed and, uh, with young people today up through seniors who truly still believe that it is a, a blob of tissue. Yeah. And um, you know, I never had an abortion, but I lost a baby in my womb. She, um, the cord cut and cut off the air. Um, but in that... Um, when you lose a baby from something like that or abortion, it leaves a hole in your heart. Um, my husband and I have worked with Celebrate Recovery people for a number of years now, and in that, a lot of women, abortion comes up, and it does leave a hole in their heart forever until Jesus comes and, and fills that hole back up. But one of the things that um, I hope is, I, I hope and wish that somehow um, this movie could come to um, maybe high school around America. I would love to see that. And what would the probability of having something like that happen? Oh, it's super easy. You just get the film, and then uh, you can get a you can you have to get a license if it's shown outside of a home. You have to get a license. So super easy. Outreach.com forward slash unplanned. It's like a hundred bucks or something, and. Uh, or like two hundred dollars. I don't know how much it is. One hundred, two hundred dollars, and you show it, and that's it. Super easy. And uh, I think kids need to see it. You know, my daughter saw it. She's twelve. Um, I think twelve-year-old and up is appropriate to see the film. And a lot of parents are like, "Well, I don't want to expose my kids to this so young." And I'm like, "Honey, they're already exposed." I mean you aren't doing your kids any favors by sheltering them from this information. You know, they need to know the truth. We did abortions on girls as young as 10 and 11 years old. Um, so to pretend like kids don't know what's happening or, you know, <laughs> A and B equals C, they know, right? And social media is pumping, the media is pumping it into their brains all the time. They need to hear messages of chastity and holiness, and they need to hear. Now, I remember growing up, you know, it was like, uh, you know, don't have sex, don't have sex, don't have sex, right? 
but there needs to be a more complete conversation like as to why right like what are our bodies made to do what is our fertility about why do we have it fertility should be shared between a husband and wife it's not just the responsibility of the woman right it's it's shared um you know our bodies are holy we, we worship with them we worship christ with them they're important our bodies are not just some hunk of skin that we use until we get to heaven our bodies have significant importance they have significance while we're here how we use it how we worship with it how we have that embrace with our spouse what what does that mean why do we have it so our kids need to be learning those things at a young age you know i my kids um there's a uh, some of you may have heard of it it's called theology of the body um, you know, I think every single youth group, every, every high school, every junior high, every youth group and church across this country, whether you're Catholic or not, should be using a Theology of the Body program. It's incredibly beautiful. Um, it teaches kids the why of our sexuality. Um, it teaches them the beauty of their bodies and their sexuality. Um, and it eliminates the confusion. Right? And they have a, a, something called TOB, Theology of the Body for Tots, that's really cute, that you can start teaching to your young children, um, even before they start school, like what our bodies are for, and who can touch our bodies, and who can't touch our bodies, and things like that, you know, teaching them just the sacredness of our body and what we're meant to do with it. And uh, so I really think that's a fantastic program. My daughter's school uses it, and... Um, it touches on social media. It's, I mean, but, you know, parents, we've got to be really open and honest with our kids. We've got to be talking about this with our kids. We have got to be, like, helicopter parenting, our kids' cell phones. Like, my, I tell my daughter all the time, no, you don't have a cell phone. I have a cell phone that I loan to you. And so I can check it anytime I want right? I am like all up in my daughter's business, not because I want to be nosy, but because I have a responsibility as her parent to protect her. And, you know, and kids are so innocent and trusting and they should be, right? That's, I mean, that's just their innocence. Like my daughter uh, gave her phone number to some guy at the water park when we were there one day and one day I'm looking at her phone looking through her text messages and um, I see a message on there from a number I don't know and our rule is if I don't know their mama you cannot talk to them on your phone okay that's the rule so um, I'm like you know what number is this and she's like oh it's just you know some guy I met at the water park he's like I don't know, 12 13 or something I'm like you're not allowed to talk to him you know that's a rule she lost her phone for a week she gets it back you know, I'm like, you cannot talk to him. She's like, okay. She comes to me crying because, like, a couple weeks later, the guy sends her a pornographic picture through text on her cell phone, even though she had told him, I'm not allowed to talk to you anymore. And she comes to me, and she's, like, crying and, like, oh, my gosh, look, look at this, Right? And I was so thankful that she felt comfortable to come to me and talk to me about it. And then we blocked the number. You know, I was like about ready to call his mama, uh, but I didn't know her. And so, you know, I mean, but that we have to be invested in the business of our kids. But we have to have very open dialogue with them and open communication. And I think our schools also have a responsibility to, you know, because some parents aren't doing that. And kids need to be able to go somewhere that they trust. And for some kids, teachers, that's who they trust. And so we need to be having dialogue with our kids in our schools, you know, teachers, counselors, principals, whoever, letting them know that if something happens and, and something inappropriate happens, we're a safe place for you to come. You know, it doesn't mean there's not going to be a consequence, but it's safe to come here because we love you and we want to protect you. So, all right, I think. Okay. Oh, okay, last sorry. question. All right, Hi. go. Abby. Yes. 
So great to see you and meet you. I want to thank you so much. Um, I, I saw an ad for the movie, and then I got the book. So only because of the movie did I even know about the book. So now all of a sudden I know about abortion. And I am one of these people who like knew really nothing. Now I'm getting so much information. I'm super thankful for it. What I wonder, my first question really was, where's Fulton? I wanted to meet Where's him. Where's Fulton? That Fulton was really my first dad. question if yeah, we're doing yeah. two questions. And then yeah, my second is, question is yeah, just... Yeah, Fulton's at home. Yeah, I miss him. And then my second question is about um, where, how do you keep up to receiving and getting the information from Planned Parenthood after all these years of not being there? And, you know, how will you continue to, to tell us everything that you yeah. know? You know, that's my question. So I sign up for all their lists. Yeah. So I'm on local affiliate lists. I get all the tweets. My phone is constantly blowing up with, not tweets, uh, text messages from Planned Parenthood telling me what they're doing, what they're planning, um, you know, their talking points, their perspectives. So I sign up for all their listservs. I'm on all their email lists. Um, I get uh, mail, I get snail mail sent to me and their direct mail program. They keep sending it even though I never give them money. Um, and so I try to stay abreast that way, but I have an advantage because I have workers leaving like every week from the clinic. And so, you know, I can go to them and say, okay, when, when I was at the clinic, we did this. Are you still doing this? What has changed? You know, how has the conversation changed within Planned Parenthood? And so I stay pretty current on what's going on. And, like, even I'll get, you know, a, an email or something, and I'll say, uh, tell, me, tell me more about this, right? And they may have, like, the scoop about, you know, what's really behind it. So I try to stay really up to date on Planned Parenthood, what they're doing, and I do that primarily through the workers that are coming out and asking them questions. So... Thank you. Abby, could you accommodate one last question yeah, from my yeah, good friend course. Dale here? Yes. So, Dale, the final question. Big pressure. Uh, I right. don't need a microphone. Well, the uh, live stream. Live stream, yes. Okay. But uh, Life Conception Act. Yeah. I've watched for 75 years the demoralization of America and uh, never got Life Conception Act through Congress. Will it ever? And now, a few days ago, HSS, Health and Human Services, simply proclaimed that life begins at conception. Your comment, will anything ever come of it? Hmm. Um, well, I don't want to be a downer, but I don't see a lot of help coming from our federal legislators. I mean... Trump has done great things, but there's a, we have a long way to go, and our Congress can't even get a bill passed that said, if a baby is born alive after a botched abortion, you must care for it as a patient. So if we can't even get that passed, I don't really see how we are anywhere close to getting a life at conception bill passed. Um, no, no, um, uh, they will when it comes to, um, who receives money, things like that. But as far as getting bills passed on the federal level, no, um, you know, I, I think that, um, I think that the bulk of the work is going to have to be done in state legislative houses. Um, and unfortunately, you're here. Um, but, you know, it doesn't mean you don't keep fighting. And, and, and actually, um, there was some legislation. Sometimes it's not, a, it's not, sometimes passing legislation is not as important as beating down bad legislation so it doesn't get passed. And I can tell you that there have been some really, really 
bad legislative efforts that have been put forward here in the state of California that have been completely squashed because of pro-life groups, because of pro-life assembly people, um, and because people rallied together and, and, and got it done. So, you know, I think that, that um, there is still hope even in California, that, you know, and, and you guys will just have to keep fighting, keep making a lot of noise um, to keep these bad bills away from your state and particularly away from your kids because the state of California is really trying to infiltrate schools, very actively infiltrate schools with abortion propaganda. And so that's really the most important thing, I think, that you guys are fighting against right now. But there are large coalitions of people doing that, that are working actively to do that. So I have a lot of hope. Um, and, you know, if any of you pro-lifers, if you ever get tired of living in California, we would love to have you in Texas. So I'm just saying. <laughs> or Indy, all right. You can have them too. So uh, thank you all so much for having me here. You are the real deal, sister. Thank you for your work to the glory of Christ and for the unborn and the families. So I uh, want to tell you a little bit what's happening next. We have two breakaway sessions. Breakaway number one starts at 345 pretty soon. And we're going to ask all the uh, PECLU uh, teachers and staff members that are helping in, in the various class, classes to please go to be there for our presenters. All of them are great. Uh, everyone who is a breakaway presenter is gifted, is offering some fantastic presentations to equip you, to bless you, to inspire you. Uh, you just can't go wrong. And uh, Lucas said something about, you know, who stays in here. And, and honestly, it's just because of, of added public exposure. Um, Pastor Michael Selmink is fantastic, but he travels all over the place, right, Michael? People know you, right? Uh, some of us don't travel as much, but what they're offering is still great. So whatever catches your eye, please go. Now, Abby Johnson is going to be signing, autographing, books and it's going to be right right over there uh, along the exhibitors row outside along the exhibitors row and so if you want to buy one of her books you can do that today on the way to the breakaway presentation you're going to so let's get up stretch go out and have a great time see you back here when we have our closing worship